I think when you talk about the hierarchy, so some of these old hierarchies you would see would have you know, a systematic review or meta-analysis at the top, and then you'd have randomized controlled trials after that, and then non-randomized you know, controlled trials. Then you have observational studies, controlled observational studies usually first, and then you have like case series and time series and things like that. And then you might have opinion at the bottom. Um, I think the thinking about what the hierarchy looks like has really kind of changed. And I would actually say that um, a meta-analysis is, uh, it's really a synthesis of the evidence. I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that it belongs on the hierarchy. It's how you put together all of the evidence that's in the hierarchy. And what I mean by that is if you have really lousy studies and do a systematic review or meta-analysis, it's still really lousy evidence. It may be the best synthesis of that evidence, um, but it's, you know, it's not high quality evidence um, in terms of um, what your decision is going to be. Um, so a meta-analysis or a systematic review is just how you put together you know, what's out there. Um, opinion is kind of the same thing. An opinion is basically just a really unsystematic review. Um, so I would say that opinion is really not a, a type of evidence either. It's how people, you know, think about or look at, you know, what's out there. Opinion is always based on something, and a systematic review is always based on something. Uh, so, I mean, the Nissen study, uh, I, I think people did realize that it wasn't well done because, as you said, there was controversy as soon as it was published. Um, so I would say that that is actually an example where something was published and people questioned the methods uh, almost immediately. How it gets played out is a whole, you know, different question. But it's no different from a randomized controlled trial that comes out where everybody thinks it's the best thing um, ever, and we find out, you know, a couple of years later that there is some issues with it. That has happened many times uh, with drugs like celecoxib and rofecoxib and others. Um, so, I, you know, it's it, this is, uh, I, I would say to some degree, you know, this is kind of what you see when people conduct scientific research, whether it's a synthesis or whether it's conducting primary research. Um, you know, we've you know, I, I've done reviews for uh, many different things, um, and we often come across systematic reviews that are done very poorly. And we will grade them down, and we'll say that these are things that we really shouldn't include as, you know, part of the literature review because uh, they're not done well. And there are times where we find a bunch of systematic reviews, and we don't even find one that we think is usable uh, because we think there are problems with the methods. Um, so I, I did a very big systematic review on low back pain interventions. Um, this wasn't sponsored by AHRQ. It was sponsored by the American College of Physicians and the American Pain Society. Um, but we looked at uh, systematic reviews for, you know, there's about 60 different types of low back pain interventions. And just to do the review, you have to kind of look at, you know, systematic reviews or meta-analyses or else you'd never finish the review because there's too much to look at. Um, and there are some interventions, uh, like for some of the interventional therapies, um, like uh, epidural steroid injections and things like that, where people do systematic reviews. Uh, they miss studies. Uh, there was one where they called a study a randomized controlled trial, even though um, you know patients basically decided which therapy they were going to be on. Uh, there were situations where they pooled. Uh, studies. Uh, they quantitatively performed meta-analysis uh, when it was clear they shouldn't have. The interventions were completely uh, different. Um, or they just pooled uh, results um, without uh, taking advantage of randomization, meaning that they would take 10 studies that looked at one intervention and 10 studies that looked at another intervention and just uh, report, you know, how many people responded uh, in one group versus the other without actually looking at randomized trials. Um, and, and uh, estimating, you know, uh, intervention versus control um, response rates, those kinds of things. Um, other studies just throw in observational studies with the randomized controlled trials. Some of the systematic reviews uh, made no distinction between randomized controlled trials and observational studies and just uh, uh, mixed everything together uh, when they uh, pooled their data. So all of those things are big problems, and um, in many cases, they kind of invalidate the reviews. The other big thing is when reviews get too old. So after 
you know, five or six years or even just a couple of years for a rapidly evolving field like HIV treatments or something, um, these systematic reviews can become outdated uh, quite quickly. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of reasons why we throw out systematic reviews. Um, there's also issues that come up with the statistics. So one of the issues with the Nissen trial, the Nissen review, you know, is that they were looking at secondary outcomes um, from studies that weren't designed to look at those kinds of outcomes. Uh, they were looking at rare events, um, and they were looking, and, and there's a lot of debate over what the proper statistical technique uh, to use with those is, um, as well as other issues, of course, uh, with those. Um, so all of these come up uh, when, when people conduct systematic reviews. Um, and yeah, those things should be vetted, and those things should be, you know, th that's when something goes out into the public, um, I, you know, like I said, with the Nissen uh, review, um, there was a lot of controversy about it, and it was almost immediate. And that's, you know, these issues come to light, I think. Um, and as people become more familiar with kind of these methods and how to distinguish when something is done well from when something is done poorly, um, you know, that, that's, this is what's going to happen. Well, I mean, I think that there needs to be, like, you know, uh, I think, as I said before, there is a uh, move towards standardization across all centers that are doing these kinds of things, not just the EPCs, but, you know, other groups as well. Um, and I think people are converging on the same types of issues that we think are important when you conduct these uh, systematic reviews. So, so yeah, I think that uh, we should have, you know, there are published standards. Um, uh, this PRISMA um, statement is, a, um, is another standard on how to report systematic reviews so people can actually know what was done, and, and people have been following that. Uh, it used to be called Quorum, and now it's called PRISMA. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, I think as, uh, as, uh, as, these, as we kind of move forward, we're going to continue to uh, evolve in that direction where things are starting to converge and, and the methods um, will become, you know, uh, uh, more standardized.